Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Bonavera Discussion Brief. I'm Kate O'Regan. I'm the director of the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at the University of Oxford. And we're really delighted today to be talking to two experts on the general comment number 37 on Article 21 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the right to peaceful assembly. We have with us Christoph Haynes, who was at the time a member of the Human Rights Committee and therefore one of the authors of the general comment. And we also have with us Marco Milanovic from the University of Nottingham. Uh, Christoph Haynes is a professor of um, international law at the University of Pretoria. And as I said, has served on the Human Rights uh, Committee um, in relation to the ICCPR until he left at the end of last year. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation between them, talking about both the making of the general comment, um, the issues that ar arise in it, and Marco is then going to make a critique some aspects of the general comment. Uh, a particular welcome here to those people who are, are participants in the Price Media Global Moot. Uh, many of you will know that um, the Article 21 is an issue in, in this year's uh, moot problem, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to put questions to um, Professor Haynes and Professor Manalovich uh, later in the session. So for those of you who aren't certain, your Q&A button is at the bottom of your screen on the right-hand side, and please feel free to add questions there while uh, Professor Haynes and Professor Milanovic are speaking, and I'll then moderate those questions when we get to Q&A. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn over to Christoph. Welcome, Christoph. It's wonderful to have you at the discussion group, and we're really much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for this opportunity um, to discuss this with you and also that is linked to the moot court because that is a, a way in which the message, I think, of such a document can be uh, further taken. Um, so uh, I, I thought I'll give a little bit of an overview of where the general comment comes from, where it fits in, and perhaps the main uh, elements that I think are worth noting. And then, of course, uh, uh, we can talk about anything, uh, any particular aspect there. Um, so perhaps just to emphasize then that last year in July, um, the, in the middle of the year, the Human Rights Committee met to then, then adopt the final version of the general comment. So this was uh, during the time of COVID. So we did the, it was the first international instrument that was uh, drafted uh, and, and completed online, um, where while we did start a year and a half earlier in person uh, to do so. At the same time, also July of last year, the, Human, um, the, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, released a document called the UN Human Rights Guidance on Less Lethal Weapons in Law Enforcement, which is in a, in a way an update um, of the basic principles on the use of force and firearms of 1990. So uh, whereas that first document focused uh, primarily on, on firearms, and talked about non-lethal weapons. In the meantime, of course, these weapons have used and they often used in the context of assemblies as well. Um, and the, the idea was then to give guidance on that. And these two documents run together. The general comment um, defers really largely to the, uh, in respect of the use of force, to what is said in, this, in, the, uh, uh, in the guidance on less lethal weapons. So it was in a way then 2020, um, not that we, entirely knew that this was going to happen was a year um, that we then in a way redrafted and restated uh, um, the law on assemblies and of course it then Black Lives Matter happened um, and around the world there were protests in fact about COVID as well and in the context of COVID um, and we were able even as we were drafting uh, the document I remember one evening uh, looking at the footage from Portland and somebody was taken away in an unmarked van and I realized this is not in the document. And then, uh, of course, the next day, I discussed it with my colleagues and, and we, de we dealt with it. And the issue of, for example, requiring social distancing, um, I think the first picture I saw was in Israel, where people were in a parking lot and each person assigned to one parking lot, and there were thousands of them. Um, and, and so it was quite interesting to have this, this, uh, this uh, uh, development uh, against the backdrop of, of uh, around the world and also uh, assemblies um, taking place. Um, so I, I think the, 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 the issue of peaceful assemblies has become very relevant in the 20th century. We know that most of the major changes that come about, came about during that century uh, 
in one way or another involve peaceful assemblies. And it may be uh, 1906 in South Africa where it started with Gandhi, or there may be other starting points, um, but the uh, uh, women being able to vote in, in the UK, um, the civil rights movement in the US, anti-Vietnam um, changes uh, in terms of apartheid in South Africa, the end of Soviet style communism. Um, all of these had, and, and the war in Iraq and, and uh, later on in the next century, um, and the Arab Spring, all of these had major components of, um, of where peaceful assembly played a role. And also in terms of bringing to the end autocratic regimes in Madagascar and Georgia and Ukraine, Tunisia, Egypt, Sudan, Zimbabwe, um, but at the same time, not always for pro-human rights causes. Peaceful assemblies have been used, and I think 6 December, uh, 6 January of this year looms large, uh, where at least initially it was a peaceful assembly um, that then was used for very different sort of purposes. And we know with Charlottesville and other cases as well, and anti-LGBTI demonstrations. Um, so it is a complex issue, but the point I want to make is that it is something that plays a very significant role. It, to some extent in renegotiating the social contract uh, today worldwide. And whereas one may say previously, people either had to stay within the system or resort to, to, to violent resistance, there's now a very strong uh, middle option uh, that can be used. And the question then is how to, to regulate it. And there are very interesting studies that have been done on, uh, on, on the last century of peaceful assembly saying that it, it's actually twice as successful in terms of achieving its own objectives uh, as when compared to, to violent resistance. But that's against that background then that the right of peaceful assembly is set out um, in the covenant of civil and political rights in article 21, it's in the major regional human rights instruments, 184 states have it in their constitutions, um, but it's very brief. It says in article 21, um, that the right of peaceful assembly shall be recognized, and then it says how it can be limited. Now, what, what does one mean with peaceful? What does one mean with assembly? Um, how can it be limited? What are the obligations? Those are the questions that, that loom large. And obviously the Human Rights Committee, like other human rights bodies, have dealt with these issues in an ad hoc basis over many years. But the general comment then is an opportunity where the Human Rights Committee and the other treaty bodies do it as well, where you almost stand back a little bit, in this case for, for almost two years, where we then said, yes, we'll continue with our individual communications, we'll continue with our state reports, where we deal with these things as well, but we also want to make up our minds uh, for and get a comprehensive overview um, of what we understand with this right. And then, of course, there are the UN limitations, 10,700 words. So that, in this particular case, boiled down to 102 paragraphs. It's, uh, it's just under 20 pages, and it has to be within that. So that's then where the, um, the, the uh, guidance on less lethal weapons came in as a handy uh, sort of uh, a parallel process where many of those things could be, could be dealt with. So the general comment we like to think of in the Human Rights Committee as an authoritative interpretation by the body uh, that has been appointed under the covenant, which has been ratified by 173 states, um, to interpret aspects of the covenant. And so general comment 36 dealt with the right to life. And before that, we dealt with things such as freedom of expression and so on. The earlier general comments of, of uh, um, 40 years ago, were very short, um, basically just the assessment done, uh, legend has it over a weekend somewhere, um, but now it's, it's quite a process. And in terms of the, um, the general comment then, the process, uh, so there are typically two readings. So there's a rapporteur, um, and so in this case, I had the opportunity to serve as the rapporteur, a member of the committee who does the first draft and then steers the process and then presents the first draft to the committee. Um, and we also uh, invited uh, comments and we got, I think about 140 comments from uh, NGOs, including Bonavero, by the way, um, and also from national human rights institutions and from other uh, UN bodies and 22 states, including three of the, of the uh, P3. Um, so they give comments then right at the beginning. We 
integrate that into the document so the rapporteur presents it to the committee and some of it we accept, some we don't, but we, we try to, to give everybody a fair hearing there and at least then uh, give some reasons why we take this or that. And then we have a second, once we've done that, gone through it paragraph by paragraph and, and, and literally uh, comma by comma, um, we have our first draft ready. And then we started with the process again. And then we had again uh, uh, consultations. And in this case, we had also oral uh, inputs by states. Um, because technology plays such a role these days, so technology in the form of, of less lethal weapons, but also the whole question um, of facial recognition, online assemblies, um, st stopping the, um, the internet, um, shutdowns, um, mass surveillance, uh, all those things play a role um, and for that reason it's also quite technical and then we went to a particular university uh, not too far away from where you are um, and there we had a discussion with uh, um, on, with roboticists and people who work um, on on the internet and uh, and so forth on on the and political scientists and so on uh, working on the question whether um, entirely online assemblies are protected by article 21. So I think it was well established that if you use Twitter, like was done in, in, uh, in Iran, for example, uh, to organize an in-person assembly, that that is covered. Uh, but if the entire assembly takes place online, say big parts of Me Too, for example, um, is that protected by 21? So we had a two-day discussion there. And we had regional meetings uh, where NGOs then um, gave comments on the drafts as it, as it went along. Um, so based on that, I, I, we, we then have the final document. I think it's, uh, the, to me, the main, um, well, the reason why, why, why I think it is, is useful to, to do something like that is that, um, the, the, and, and why it was useful to have a general comment on this particular topic, is to emphasize just by its mere existence that, that uh, uh, peaceful assemblies is a legitimate use of the public and other space. Um, and to to and many things flow from that. So, for example, we eventually said there should not be any requirement of authorization because it's a basic right that one exercises. And if the state wants to limit the right, it has to prove uh, that it has uh, that it has a good basis to do so. So, the starting point is to say this is a this was from a Spanish case um, that, uh, but I see in, used by a number of courts around the world. Um, to say that the public space is not just for circulation, but also participation. So it's, it rhymes in Spanish and it rhymes in English and it, it, it has a certain appeal to it. Um, so that's the first point. The second one is that peaceful assemblies, things often go wrong with peaceful assemblies. It has a potential for things to go wrong. And there, I think it's extremely useful to have a, uh, if you want to call it sort of dramatically uh, rules of engagement, um, but I think sometimes it is almost that, that the different parties know at least what, what, uh, what are the official rules, even if they don't obey them, but there's at least some kind of reference uh, that they use and they are in that sense on the same, on the same page. So th that, that I would see as, as where the document comes from and then just to perhaps list uh, the main features and, and we can talk about them in more detail. Um, but I think the first one um, is, is indeed this rationale. It sets out that peaceful assembly is part of democracy. Um, it's a, a way of, uh, I didn't use Gandhi's words, but th those, those were, th that's what I had in mind, um, is to say that one can test ideas. So Gandhi talked about experiments with truth, um, but one can test ideas and you can, you can test support for ideas through peaceful assembly. Um, and so the rationale sets this out um, in the second place, um, and, and, and this is something that's not written in the general comment, but, they, but it's almost what drives it, um, is to say the dividing line between acceptable and unacceptable peaceful assembly, or assemblies in general, um, is not whether they're lawful or not. That's the traditional approach. This is an unlawful gathering, you will be dispersed in three warnings, or in the French case, uh, uh, three drum beats, and, and, and then uh, the, the Riot Act of 1714, which found its way into many uh, domestic systems. The question is, is it declared unlawful by the officer there? And the underlying uh, principle, I think, in the general comment is to say that's not the important line. The important line 
to police and important line that makes the distinction between acceptable and unacceptable is, is it violent? Um, and so that gives a bit of a leeway in terms of which civil disobedience and other, even if there's to some extent notification laws may be broken or something like that, it's not immediate reaction there. The reaction comes in when it's violent. So the whole question of what is violence becomes important. And that's, that's a whole part of the document to define what is violence, when is it significant enough to act against, and uh, then when can the situation be deemed to be violent. Um, so the dividing line is, is not lawful, unlawful, but violent, uh, non-violent. Um, and then I think the third point uh, that, that runs through the document is to say, what this is a, an activity that is engaged in collectively because by definition it's a gathering. So it's more than one person. One lone protester standing with a poster is not covered by the, by the right. Um, but the assessment should be done as far as possible on an individualized basis. So the assessment whether there's, uh, there should be action because of violence should be constrained to the individuals um, and also uh, organizing responsibilities for the, uh, the person's own actions, so individualized assessment. Uh, a very broad scope of the right, um, so it's uh, indoors, outdoors, it is on publicly accessible space and in, on private space and then offline and online. So a very broad scope for the right. But then, of course, the next question becomes, it's not an absolute right. It can be limited. When can it be limited? And then the justifications for that. Um, and then to conclude, I think the general features that the general comment tried to emphasize of a, a, a human rights approach to peaceful assemblies is that any um, th that this obligation on the state to not unduly interfere, a negative obligation, but also a positive obligation to facilitate and protect um, and the actions must be content neutral, so it's not based on the uh, um, on the cause that's pursued, but also not the links between the authorities and those who are engaging in protest and whether they are opponents or undesirables, or however one wants to define it. Content neutral, um, time, manner, and place may be regulated, but it must still be possible within sight and sound. Okay, so I think those are perhaps some of the most uh, important elements. Um, and, and, and there's an interesting issue we can perhaps in the discussion talk about how journalists uh, are, are viewed, uh, because we did have a, 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 a discussion about this, whether journalists are actually protected under Article 21, or are they protected under Article 19? And, and, and this, this, uh, this has an interesting sequel. Um, and then criticisms, I can perhaps just mention that there are, I think, a number of criticisms uh, can be leveled and have been leveled. Uh, regional standards, how, we, how do we deal with them? Um, that we, we tried as much as we can, uh, because I have a very strong interest in the regional systems, but the balance, getting the balance right between, say, European court cases and the African system and so on, um, I, I, has been picked up by a number of people. There's a high level of generality with, with many of the uh, provisions of the general comment. Um, uh, the content neutrality itself is controversial. Some people say, well, how can you not make a distinction between pro-human rights and anti-human rights? And the events on the 6th of January, I mean, there is something to that. Do you view them in the same way? Uh, is it content, new are you really content neutral? Um, and then I think Marco, and, and I'm sure he will raise it, uh, has raised the question of the heckless veto and, to, and how the general comment uh, deals, deals with that. But I think that perhaps gives a bit of a, the lay of the land kind of thing. Thanks, Christoph. That was a really clear and uh, interesting overview. I'm now going to turn to Marco um, maybe to give some of his views on, on the GC. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kate, uh, for, for inviting me. Thank you, Christoph, for, for, for your, your opening remarks, and thanks for everybody for, for attending. I, I'm, I'm really happy to be in, in this position to, to, to comment on, on, on Christoph's talk and on, on the general comment, because it is such a great piece of work. You know, normally I, I like all professors sort of, you know, like, you know, taking some judgment saying, oh, it's horrible, it's awful, whatever, you know. And let me let me explain why. But this is not it. I mean, as as a general matter, this is an excellent piece of work. It's a it's a laudable uh, uh, work in its rigor in how clear the writing is and how accessible the style is, you know, in in in, in the timeliness. The timeliness. Is just, if you wanted it to be more timely, you could not have made it more timely, right? Mm -hmm. So as we as we have this meeting, you know, people are uh, 
are dying on the streets of Myanmar uh, to, to, to fight for their freedom, right? So in, in, in that sense, it's a, it, it could not be a, 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 a better time. And it's, it's, I, I hope it proves to be a very valuable document in the future. Now, uh, three themes sort of strike me as being very important when, when, when um, a body like the Human Rights Committee decides to draft a document of this type. The first theme is evolution. So how much new stuff is the committee going to, to, to pack into this general comment that is mostly going to be a recapitulation of its prior jurisprudence, but there will be then be new developments. So how much evolution should there be and on what basis and how will that be justified and what is the best measure of that? So that's theme number one. Theme number two, and they're all related, is how much clarity should there be and how much constructive ambiguity or strategic fudging should there be? Uh, on the one hand, you want this document to provide more clarity. So you'd, you'd say, okay, clarity is the basic goal here, right? On the other hand, there are many benefits to ambiguity, internal in the sense that the committee can agree on something, right? As, as a, when there might be opposed positions among their members, but also external in the sense that a more Ambiguous document can sometimes be more acceptable to states or other actors. And the third theme is how much divergence should there be from the case law or jurisprudence of other bodies, especially the regional bodies. So the, the, the topic that, that Christoph ended with. And in particular, I, I would really be interested in your thoughts here on this, Christoph. You know, what divergences did you identify? Specifically, for example, when you compare the general comment to the case of the European court and how and why did you choose to go you know, down a particular path? So one divergence that sort of immediately pops to my head is that the European court is very comfortable in saying that prior authorization procedures are fine. They even say a prior authorization is not an interference with the freedom of assembly. And you, in the general comment, on the other hand, say a prior authorization is only OK if de facto it amounts to nothing more than notification. And so that, that seems to me a clear, a clear divergence in, in approach. And so I, I was wondering, you know, why did you want that? What do you think that will achieve? And do you expect the European court to, to perhaps adjust itself? You know, this, this whole theme of dialogue between human rights institutions is, I think, a very interesting one. Um, I mean, just to, 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 to do a pointer here on this, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how the European court has by and large ignored General Comment 36 uh, on, 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 on many issues with regard to the right to life in armed conflict and has only now cited it for the first time in the Hanan judgment last week. So I'm wondering to what extent, you know, when you wrote the piece, when you wrote the document, how much change did you want to induce, for example, in other institutions. Let me go back to the evolution uh, 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 theme. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I found very interesting is the whole issue of cyber or online assemblies. So on the one hand, as you said, you know, that there is no controversy that, that online tools can be used to facilitate physical assemblies. And in that sense, they fall within the ambit of Article 21. So internet, so for example, now in India, there are massive protests against the Modi government by farmers. And one thing that the Modi government is routinely doing in the outskirts of Delhi, where the farmers are basically parked, camping there, is that it's shutting down the internet so that they cannot coordinate. So internet shutdowns, blocking of apps, as we have seen in many sorts of contexts. Now that clearly is directly related to the freedom of assembly. But I'm very interested in your thoughts about this whole idea of an online assembly and how useful that really is. So for example, this meeting that we're now having is an online assembly the way you find it, right? But what is the added value of saying that this is an online assembly as opposed to simply saying that we are engaging in a speech, protected speech activity under Article 19? So what does the Article 21 qualification really do here? I mean, operationally because I cannot think of operational issues that arises in this online context in the same way that they, that they do in the physical context where you constantly have the trade-offs, for example, with traffic, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, 
that simply do not arise here. So I, I, I would really like to hear your thoughts basically on, on, on that one. Anyway, so let me move to my two sort of points of, of criticism or maybe three points of criticism. Um, one, which I think is not so much an issue of criticism, but is a sort of gap in the, in the general comment is how to deal with states acting with ulterior purposes. So in paragraph 49 of the general comments, so there is this whole you know, general position, which is a, the correct position that states must not use, uh, um, must not suppress protests basically in order to suppress dissent and criticism and act for aims that are not legitimate in the sense of article 21. But I think more interesting than that, more problematic than that, and something that's really not addressed in the comment is when states act with mixed purposes. So there is a legitimate aim on the one hand of some kind, but there's also an ulterior purpose behind it. So think, for example, of protests now during the pandemic where uh, various governments have suppressed certain protests uh, on the basis that they are a danger to public health, which they are. I mean, they objectively are. Uh, whether that's Uganda from you know, uh, you know, trying to, to you know, suppress campaign events during the elections there, or now the pro Navalny protests in Russia, or even some of the stuff that's going on in Myanmar, where the authorities are saying we're trying to actually uh, protect public health. So Aung San Suu Kyi is actually going to get prosecuted for violating COVID restrictions. So you can have an easy, obvious case like that one. But then there are many, many, many other cases where states have. Uh, uh, um, limited certain assemblies for public health purposes that also have probably some kind of ulterior purpose behind it. And I don't think the Human Rights Committee generally has a clear approach on, on these issues. Uh, the European Court, as you know, has this jurisprudence under Article 18, which it is now of the convention, which it has now developed in cases like Navalny or uh, with regard to Demirtas uh, uh, very, very recently and so on. Um, and the court in that case law is now looking for what is the predominant purpose. And sometimes it does a legitimate aim and proportionality analysis without sort of by assuming a completely legitimate purpose and only latches the ulterior purpose towards the end. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Now, my, my big problem, big problem, a teeny tiny problem in comparison to the general comment as a whole is, as you said, the issue of the heckler's veto. And that's really paragraph, paragraph 52 of the general comment. So if you, if you uh, uh, I mean, if people want to open the general comment on their screens, they can, they can see the text of, of, of um, uh, paragraph 52. But the basic problem is this. Imagine there's an assembly that is completely peaceful. Every participant in the assembly is completely peaceful. There is no risk of violence emanating from the participants in the assembly. However, there is a risk of violence to them by third parties. And the issue is, what must the state do? Well, the committee says quite rightly, the state must do everything reasonable, feasible to protect the protesters from violence by third parties. But what if it can't? Or what exactly is the sort of threshold of risk that we're talking about here? You know, How much security must the state provide? Well, then the committee says, in the exceptional case where the state is manifestly unable to protect the participants from a severe threat to their safety, restrictions on participation in the assembly may be imposed. They must withstand strict scrutiny, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but they may still be imposed. And I wrote a blog this a piece on this on, on Eagle Talk that dealt with precisely that type of case where I was counsel, <coughs> excuse me, post COVID cough, uh, uh, um, uh, on a <coughs> Um, here in Belgrade, on behalf of the Belgrade Center for Human Rights, we represented gay rights organizations that tried to organize four gay pride parades in Belgrade that were under threat from violence from you know, Nazi sort of local types. And the government in one instance relocated the assembly to the middle of nowhere. And then in three in instances outright banned the assembly on the basis that uh, uh, it could not guarantee the safety of the participants. Now, the fundamental issue for me here is this. If you are the participant and you are willing to risk your life to participate in the protest, uh, 
should we have a categorical rule that says that the state can never jump into your shoes and say, well, we have the duty to protect your life. And for that reason, you cannot walk in the street. So at what point in time, that's I think the fundamental problem, is state paternalism permissible in this, in this regard? You know? So the gay rights advocates that we represented, they were willing to take the risk that something bad might happen to them. And in fact, they take that risk all the time, right? So people protesting now in Myanmar are willing to risk their lives at the protest. And really the issue for me is on the assumption of a good faith actor, when can the state state substitute its own judgment and say to the participants, we cannot protect you, therefore you cannot march, you cannot assemble. And so even if the, the answer that the committee gave in paragraph 52 is the right one, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, it's not an obvious issue, right? But even if it's the right one, I'm wondering whether this should have been an issue that was kept ambiguous and fudged rather than one that was made more explicit or clear in the way you have done so here, because as I look at article, uh, paragraph 52, I am willing to bet that states like Serbia are going to use that to suppress protests by saying, well, we couldn't guarantee the safety of the participants and we did all we could to, to do so. And that will be you know, an issue for a certain subset of cases. So the gay rights stuff is I think the most obvious, but not only that. So anyway, that's the one sort of point in the, in the general comment where, where I really felt you should have said less <laughs> rather than more. But, but all in all, as I said, I thought it was a remarkably good uh, piece of work, a, 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 a really genuine achievement. Uh, uh, for our times. So let me stop there. I hope I haven't spoken too much too long. Thanks, Marco. That was great. And uh, Chris, <coughs> want to respond to some of that? Yes, yes. And thank you very much, Marco. It's a very penetrating and and and, and I think stimulating uh, engagement. Um, so so I will probably not be able to respond to everything, but let me let me on, on a number of topics. So the one of um, of evolution. Um, how, how far and how fast uh, does one go? Uh, and in particular, you asked about online assemblies, to what extent crossing this bridge from saying that this organizing of, of uh, particular uh, physical assemblies online, of course, that's covered, but then that extra step, um, that, that completely remote um, assemblies are also covered. I must say my own, um, while well, talking about evolution, my, my own starting point was that the essence of of a peaceful assembly is physical presence. And you stand there and you say, deal with me. Here I stand, I can do no other, you know, and uh, um, this is, I have only one body. Um, and the fact that I'm here today is a very strong message. Um, and th that was certainly my starting point. And in discussing with other members um, at the beginning, I think many of us had that sort of, uh, th that sort of approach. I, I, I still think that's probably the most powerful forms of peaceful assembly is where people put their bodies on the line. Um, but let me also not be too dramatic. But of course, you have uh, uh, peaceful assemblies that are simply there to celebrate something. So it's not always just the confrontation. But the ones that I'm thinking about, you know, the, 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 the sort of outstanding ones that I mentioned of the last century and so on, um, somebody standing in front of a tank in, in uh, at Tiananmen Square, that's, that's so powerful because the person stands there and say, deal with me. Um, so, the, but so so that was the starting point. Then we had a number of discussions about this, and of course, uh, NGOs focused on this quite a lot as well. Um, and I think what eventually persuaded me and my colleagues as well um, is that um, is, is the idea that it's these days almost impossible to conceptualize political engagement and social engagement between people if you try to make a complete line between online and offline. That is almost, the, the line is so blurred um, that, that one can almost not think about offline without having online somewhere in the picture as well. Um, and the, the, that, that a, a very large part of political engagement, the very thing that one wants to pull is at the heart of what you want to protect, collective political engagement through peaceful assembly, many of, the, of those actions are actually happening online. 
completely online or with a, with a, with a, with a small offline uh, component as well. Um, and so international law would, would in a way become out of date and out of touch um, if it does not recognize this new reality. Now, there, there are still a number of problems there. Um, so, 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 so for me, you know, the first point I made about you know, physical presence is important. Clicktivism and so forth. Uh, in many cases, seem to be a relatively easy option. Um, it, it, it plays a role, but but the, 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 I, I think it's true that one can say the fact that physical presence is very important. That does not, in itself, necessarily mean that collectivism has no role to play. Um, but there are a number of problems then with 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 crossing this this uh, this sort of divide into online and recognizing it. One is: Do you now take the offline um, uh, uh, restrictions online as well. So if a state can require notification, for example, offline, or if it's domestic law has authorization, for example, are you enc enc encouraging them then to, to have it online as well? So you may actually open up uh, uh, avenues for restriction, which you, which you otherwise don't have. So you have to be very clear on what that the restrictions that, uh, that the limitations on the limitations offline also apply online. And I think the the the, um, the the other inherent problem is it becomes almost it 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 becomes almost trivial then to say that a particular that every Zoom discussion is protected, every you know television discussion with two or three people coming in from Myanmar and talking here that all of that's protected, but of course the the same argument applies to freedom of expression, that every uttering is is in principle protected. And that does not make the right trivial. And so for myself, I, I, the route I took was to say, well, it's true that, that a very large part of what happens today um, and, and the meaningful engagement with governments and so forth are, are often uh, online. And if that's not protected, then the right in a way is diminishing and it no longer plays its protective role um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a different sort of uh, uh, environment. Um, so, so, so the, 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 the online uh, part then, um, I, I think it's also the, what, what is the added value then? Uh, I think it's to emphasize that it's speech when it's collective, there's a different dynamic just as we have in the streets itself. Um, and then things such as internet shutdown and so forth are serious invasions of this important uh, value. And, and so I think that was more or less the track that, uh, that, uh, that, that we followed. Um, to recognize. And then, of course, uh, uh, again, in the same way that Black Lives Matter um, uh, uh, manifested itself while we were drafting this, then almost all the assemblies started taking place online because of COVID. Uh, it was just impossible to have the, the physical ones. And I think that also, uh, in a way, became a bit of endorsement, although we took the decision to recognize online assemblies on the very last Friday before we abandoned the March uh, meeting of the in-person meeting in Geneva and went home. Uh, there we did say, okay, we, 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 th this is the principal position we're going to take. But then it became much clearer as we went along. And I think by July, when we were all doing this online, we realized how much uh, this, uh, what role this now plays. Um, the one about uh, divergence with um, regional and other bodies, and of course there's sometimes this question also between different uh, UN treaty bodies as well. But the notification is a clear, is, is indeed a clear example where we follow different approaches. So, so the, with the European court, um, they don't even take the first step. I think as you also alluded to that this is an infringement um, of the right to have notification. That's just an administrative action. Um, and, and so it doesn't come in in the same way that we, the structure of the general comment is we first say what the scope is, what the obligations on the states are, um, then what the restrictions are, and notification in the first draft was part of that, but then notification disappears and everybody wants to know what it is. So we gave it a separate heading, but it still follows under restrictions and we, 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 we view it as a, as a restriction. Um, and I think the underlying philosophy there was that, that uh, if it's a, if, if, if um, authorization itself, if you, if you are required to ask for authorization, it's no longer a right. And so many things follow from that. Um, so if you if you need to get permission for this, then the state doesn't have to justify it, and um, the organizer responsibility and all those sort of things are much easier to justify if that's your starting point. So I think there the benefit was 
to stand back and not just case by case, but ask what are the implications if you say that this uh, uh, this is a um, this is a, uh, something for for which you must ask permission. So it's actually the state that holds it in reserve. So it was that bird's eye view, I think, that made it clear. And it's actually stronger in this general comment now um, than I drafted it initially. My colleagues felt felt quite strongly about that uh, about that part. Um, it, it, it does raise the question of, of coherence between the system and so forth, but we hope that in some cases the, uh, we follow the European court in some cases, so I, I hope that in others uh, they, they may um, follow us. On the criticisms part, um, the, the, yeah, and, and, and I think both of them are indeed linked, uh, the, 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 what sort of language do you use in the general comment which can, then not, be, can it not be abused by, by states? So a good example would be, we first had um, the, the, the phrase, um, the right of peaceful assembly is not an absolute right. And of course that can, it's true, but do you want to say it like that? And we had the word when we described uh, um, uh, violent meetings, we refer to it as riots. Now riots has also become quite a loaded term. Um, and so we took that out um, and we just talked about sort of more, more, uh, uh, dispassionate language about when is it deemed violence and sort of lawyer-like language and not the police kind of riot um, uh, language. Um, so, so the, the and, and it will be interesting to, to we, we don't have a particular philosophy on predominant purpose. It's uh, of course necessity, proportionality, objective test. But as you say, the interesting and the difficult one is when you've got bona fide and male in the same in the same way. And it may be, that may be then indeed the case. To, to look at how the European court approaches it. The heckler's veto, uh, yes, so, so uh, um, we did exchange uh, emails at the time when, when, when you wrote about that. And then I, th I was just looking at earlier today and we say, we hope we have an opportunity to discuss this in person at some point. Well, so as far as online is in, in person, uh, we have this opportunity now. Very briefly, um, I, I, I understand where you come from and in particular that it may be abused, but it's, it seems to me that the, the, well, at least the starting point there is to say that if you have an assembly and it's threatened by, by another assembly, um, if you recognize the, the due diligence obligation on the state also to protect the right to life and the right of assembly and others or everything else of the first, of the first group, if you do not recognize it in a document like this, states would also look at this and say, well, it doesn't even address this particular problem. Um, and the way it's put now, I think is, is uh, and, and you quoted it, it is quite, uh, um, it, it is quite carefully phrased to say that other alternatives, for example, to, to, um, to have the meeting at a different time, a different date and so forth, um, can be, uh, should first be explored. Um, and then also the language says, um, if, even if significant law enforcement capabilities were to be deployed, um, if they're not able to con uh, contain the situation, then these steps may be taken. So the language initially was that um, they must take all, all possible measures, um, the state, uh, to protect people against, against others. And, and, and that, that's, uh, that, that may be more in the, in, in the line that you are pushing, they should take, you, you state it stronger. My concern there was, and, and, and uh, somebody else mean, uh, raised this and I agreed with it, if you say all the state must take all possible measures, um, that implies that they have to bring in the military, for example, if that's the only way to actually protect the first group. And in, in the rest of the document, we try to steer away from the military, these extreme measures being used. So now the language is just significant law enforcement capability, but in the same way that um, a state has the obligation to protect, for example, if there is a pandemic in the streets that they at some point have a obligation to say they should be social distancing, or if there's a fire in the streets and they have a due, uh, due diligence obligation, there's a fire hazard in the streets, to say you cannot have a demonstration here. If there's a truly established, and it's not a, just a pretext, if there is a threat to life of the first group, I think it falls within the, uh, the due diligence obligation of the state to protect them. Um, but I do agree with you that this, like, me, uh, like much of the other language, can, can in some cases be, be uh, abused, but to leave it out, I think would, would also leave the situation that it's almost as if you are not even contemplating this particular situation.
Thanks, Christoph. Um, Marco, any quick response at this stage before we turn to Q&A? Yes, let me just respond to that very last point. So I completely agree with you, Christoph, that the point about uh, uh, positive obligations that the state must do everything feasible, take all possible measures, whatever language you want to use precisely to protect the protests from threats by, by third parties, that it has to be in, you know. So I'm, I'm completely okay with, with all of that being in. What I have a problem with is the, 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 the second step following from that, which is that if the state exhausts all feasible measures to protect a particular peaceful assembly, then it can resort to prohibiting a particular event. That's the, that's the step I have a, a problem with. Um, I don't have a, because it simply means that if you have enough capable violent people in a society, that the state cannot effectively disarm or prevent from harming others, which not even the most capable of states is, do, is able to do often, you know, uh, that effectively these violent people are able to silence protest, even if the protesters are willing to take the risk upon themselves. So what, what I think is the, the, the more difficult problem is if the risk is to third parties. Right, so if the if the violent uh, the actors bystanders. actually exactly are going to attack bystanders, that I think is the more 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 problematic scenario for my categorical kind of approach. But actually, if you look at paragraph fifty two, you did not frame it in terms of the rights of bystanders. It, it talks only about participants. Yes. Yeah. And my view is, you know, if I am willing to risk my life and only my life, and I am willing to suffer whatever risk might happen from third parties, then it should not be the state's business to stop me from doing it. The state should do everything it can to protect me. But even if despite that there's still a risk, I am the one who decides whether I should uh, you know, be subjected to that risk or not. So that's my, my basic problem. Because if we applied that same approach to other rights, I think we would clearly reach unacceptable results. So if there's a specific risk to your life, Christoph, you know, there's an assassin out to get you. And the state told you, Christoph, you cannot leave your house for the next month. We're not gonna let you leave your house because we cannot guarantee that this assassin is not gonna kill you. You're gonna tell me, well, that deprivation of liberty is not justified. It's arbitrary, and I would agree. Or if the state told you, Christoph, you're not allowed to publish anything for three months because the guy said he will kill you if you publish something, if you publish the cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad or whatever it is, you know, and therefore we're prohibiting you from, from saying things online or offline. You would say that's categorically an impermissible restriction on your freedom of speech. So that's my, my main concern. It's not the positive duty. I agree totally with the positive duty. It's the state's ability to suppress a peaceful assembly because it cannot guarantee its safety. That's my, my objection, if you will. But I agree, it's not easy. You know, I, I totally agree with that. Great. Uh, Christoph, do you want to respond or shall we bring in some of the questions? Uh Perhaps just one sentence is, is, is um, but I do think there's a difference between the, the uh, publishing um, cartoons on the profit or something like that, where it's very clear that that individual takes that risk. But if you are talking about assemblies, which can be spontaneous people joining uh, mm -hmm. bystanders and participants not always distinguished, uh, I think that's that's a much more difficult situation. And, and, they, and, and the state has an obligation then. It's a little bit like your mixed... Uh, um, ulterior motives kind of thing where it may be people who really assume this risk and they know but but how does how does one really know that all those protesters know that there's that there are people who are ready to shoot them in the streets and and then i think it's a, it's a relatively blunt instrument but at some point I, I i think it may it may be justified great well thanks very much for that exchange so i'm going to turn now to a question from martin shinen who says that he thinks the general comment is remarkable for its rigorous test in relation to per permissible limitations, including the inviolability of the essence of the right and the approach to pro proportionality, uh, where the benefit towards a legitimate aim must be greater than the resulting human rights infringement. Um, but he did wonder whether this is a, a kind of an approach that is now going to be uh, consistently adopted by the committee and he points to the fact that GC 34 on freedom of expression didn't actually uh, you know, establish such a clear approach to permissible limitations. Yes um, and and in this particular case a good example of where, where we benefited from the um, from the comments that we got so I mentioned that we had these regional meetings uh, but we also had um, 
on on uh, on just security, for example, we had comments from and, and Martin made a comment in particular on that a very detailed uh, comment, um, which we obviously as a, as a committee looked at very carefully. Um, and he and he if, if, if he was very clear in his phrasing about the proportionality test, um, which we then took back to the committee and had a long discussion about that. Eventually, I think we came out with a with a formulation which we now increasingly use in other contexts as well. Um, it's difficult to say that it will be, and and uh, and as, as as you know, my own term expired at the end of last year. Um, but we had a long discussion on this. The the committee is on board. With the way it's uh, it's phrased there, um, I think Martin criticised our first uh, uh, discussion as we are comparing not apples and oranges, but we are comparing colours and 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 substances, something along those lines. Which was quite, when I when I saw it, I thought yes, that's quite a, that seems to be quite a, a, a good argument that he gave. Um, but but the, the committee was on board with this formulation that we have, and and I certainly hope this will be followed elsewhere as well. Great, thank you. I mean, maybe I could just follow up with one of the things that struck me is that as we increasingly recognize the character of the positive obligations of the state, for example, in relation to the provision of education or health care, the, the General Committee is quite uh, broad on its um, approach to, for example, uh, the, the places in which um, uh, protests can take place and, and sort of quite, I think, rather sanguine about the fact that this is going to impact on, on, on the interests and potentially rights of third parties. And I just wondered whether we don't need to be developing a kind of a, a, a richer understanding that, for example, um, education and healthcare um, should not be uh, targeted as in ways that will prevent um, non-protesters from gaining access to something which the state actually has a pos positive duty to provide them with. And we saw some of this in uh, kind of in South Africa in relation to um, exams being targeted by pro protesting students, for example, and exams uh, actually having to be cancelled and postponed in those circumstances. And I did wonder, you know, assuming just for the moment that all of that was peaceful protest, whether in fact we wouldn't to be recognizing some duty on the state to ensure that it's positive duties to protect other forms of, uh, of right um, need to be put into this balance. Yes. Yes, um, and I just want to look at the, at the, the language there, because um, when we talk about the protecting the rights of others, um, it's in paragraph 47, restrictions imposed for the protection of the rights of freedoms of others may relate to the protection under the covenant or other human rights of people not participating in the assembly. And, and so, so the very example that you gave was, was one that we discussed. Um, because initially just said um, the protection of the rights under the covenant, um, but then of course socioeconomic rights are not are not included. And so, so the the inclusion there of, of other human rights, but that's sort of a technical way. It's not it's not upfront. Um, I think again, there's the the question is exactly the one that that Marco also referred to is is um, is then the the possible abuse of the language that one that one puts it there. So I think it's in principle there. But if you give a quotable quote uh, where people can say, well, now school children can't go to all two million school children won't be on time um, on one of these days, then, then it's, it's, it's open for abuse. I think that was the, that was the concern. But it's also, uh, again, one of the challenges, I think, with, with drafting such a document um, is the level of generality that you want to apply to all society. So some, some NGOs, for example, um, gave us examples of where people blocked uh, hospitals, um, but then when the ambulances came, they allowed them in and they made a point of it. Now that's very good and well when that happens, but if you in principle accept that's the norm, in many other societies, it won't be the norm. Um, and, and I think then, then if one if one models your your general comment on 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 such conduct, such so such good practices, uh, one may one may actually then um, not not have appropriate language for other sort of situations. I think the concern there was to was indeed to to not to not uh, give a quotable quote that can be too easily misused. Yeah, I mean, it is very difficult. And I think our thinking about the intersection between the state's duties to protect, as it were, not to invade the negative rights of people by, by limiting freedom of speech or, or um, assembly and the positive duties of the state is, is, is it's a very difficult area and difficult to deal with actually at a high level of generality. 
I'm turning then to um, Kriyang Shakkitachaisuri's question, which is um, the fact that many states have been prohibiting peaceful assembly on the grounds of trying to prevent uh, transmission to COVID, of COVID-19 um, in the circumstances of the uh, pandemic. Uh, what's your view about how uh, compliant that is with the general comment? So the general comment deals with this uh, twice. I actually have the number here somewhere. Um, so we say under um, the ground of public health, that's in paragraph 45, um, one example where this um, may come, where public health may be relied upon as a ground is where there's infectious disease um, to, to respond to. Um, and then um, in paragraph, uh, I think it's 59, um, it says in general, state parties should not limit the number of participants in assemblies. So that's the starting point. And, and so, as you know, in many cities, they would say only 500 or 5,000 people. And uh, so, so the Netherlands, for example, started with that and then it, 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 went, it went out of hand. But I think it's, the, it's the people now know more about this kind of practice. But in, in, um, in principle, states should not limit the number of participants. Any such restriction can be accepted only if there's a clear connection with a legitimate ground for restrictions, as said in Article 21. For example, with public safety considerations dictate a minimum crowd capacity for a stadium or a bridge. So, you know, not more than 3,000 people on the bridge because the thing will collapse or, uh, you know, in the same way that one has notices on, on, on lifts and so forth. Or with the public health considerations dictate physical distancing. Um, so the, the, the approach is in general to say that uh, the starting point is, is there should be no limitations, but then for that, that to recognize that some form of social distancing may be may be legitimate, but I think that brings us back to then the the question of Preta using it as a pretext and and a necessity uh, would then requ require evidence on the part of the state. So the, the the onus is on the state to show that actually limiting it to 500 instead of 5,000 people, for example, uh, they have that onus and they must bring the evidence to to show that. And and a large part of the general comment is about saying who has the owners to do what. And then of course, this the whole structure being in the first place, the scope of the right. And once it's in the scope of the right, then the obligation is on the state to, to, to justify it. But I, I, I must say from, from the discussions that we've had a number, um, we had a meeting with the African national human rights institutions and in Latin America in particular, it seems that it's very broadly misused uh, the, the pretext of, of, of COVID. Um, and and uh, it's it's so it's it's understandable I think because now the state has this power and it has this big uh, problem that it's trying to address that that is on the minds of everyone, and then that power I think gets a momentum uh, of its own. Uh, so so I think that, that those are the two parts where we try to bring it into into play. Um, but uh, that it's that it's very widely abused is is clear I think. Well, if I can jump in here as well, I mean I think the. Uh... This is precisely the example of mixed purposes that, 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 that I had yeah. mentioned, right? So that it's perfectly possible for a state to act for, for, two, you know, for, for two purposes, one of which is legitimate, protecting public health, and one of which is not. But I, I would go a bit further than that. Even if the state is acting completely in good faith, when you have a situation like this one, a pandemic that lasts on indefinitely, effectively, right? That, that is gonna be part of our lives for, for years. You can simply not have a categorical ban on, on public protest. And even numerical limitations at some point have to give way because people will care more about, for example, protesting against the government they really hate than about the risk to their lives that they're assuming, but also to their lives of others because they might infect others. So at some point we run into the problem of incommensurability. It's really hard to measure how much weight one should give to protecting public health on the one hand, and on the other hand, other things like protests being completely indispensable in a democratic society. So at some point you have to have, you have to allow as a state, protests that do carry public health risks. So you know it, it is a fact that no matter how large a protest, even if you have a small protest, it's still going to be in a non-zero risk. And at some point, a state must allow protests. You know, if you're in New Zealand and you have completely contained community transmission, and then you say, well, we're banning all protests for a month and you can protest your heart out a month later, that's fine. 
you know, that type of categorical ban is fine because you know a month later you're going to be able to protest normally. But in Serbia, where we have community transmission rampant, you know, a, a, a rule that said you cannot have any public assembly beyond X people would, would, would immediately get disobeyed and in fact was disobeyed. And whether that's political protest or, you know, our, one of our biggest singers died the other day from COVID and thousands of people assembled to, you know, uh, uh, say Whoa. farewell to him. And I'm sure some of them got COVID in the process. So at some point you cannot simply ban categorically public gatherings on the basis of preventing the transmission of this disease. It just cannot be done. Yeah, if, I, if I could perhaps cool. just, sorry. Go ahead, Stop. go ahead. Yes. Yeah, just to, to say that, 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 that of course, a, a large part of the journal comment uh, or, or a message, a strong message, a recurring message is the one of acceptance of some level of disruption. Um, so whether, whether it is, as in Kate's example, some, some level of disruption even to schools and socioeconomic rights, um, and, 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 and so we, we emphasize the um, obligation on the state, but we say this, the society as a whole has an interest in this, in the fact that these channels are open for people to address what one may see as structural violence against you. It's, 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 it's in particular the, the vulnerable who use this tool. Um, they may not have the megaphone of freedom of expression in many ways, but they can physically go. Um, and, and so it's a collective acceptance of some level of disruption. Um, and so, 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 so then perhaps just to say again, where it's a, it is on a high level of generality, and, and this is not a, this is not a, a model law that can simply be applied. But against that background, yes, some some uh, um, disruption must be accepted. And then the first normal is that there must be no restrictions on the numbers. But then, you know, within that context, in exceptional cases, one can then uh, have things such as uh, at least physical distancing uh, being required. It's, it raises issues not unlike the heckler's uh, veto, because in the circumstances where the state cannot protect people from getting COVID, which is a harm, do we then say, well, then the state can therefore ban the protest because, you know, we don't want people to be harmed from the protest. So it, it's a, I think that example is very, uh, it's a very tricky one for the, um, for, the, for the project. We've got some more really interesting questions. So the next one is, um, what standard should be used in determining whether behavior during assemblies is acceptable or unacceptable? And what is the threshold for peacefulness or violence? Um, do you want to just talk about that a little bit, uh, Christoph, from the perspective of the general comment? Yes, so, so um, the, the, the starting point is the one of individualized assessment. So as far as possible, uh, but that term as far as possible comes through in, in, in many cases, but as far as possible an individualized assessment of violence should be made and then only actions against the particular individuals uh, may be taken. So that brings in the whole controversial issue of kettling, which we have in the general comment, and that's, that's another point of criticism. Uh, the previous uh, special rapporteur on peaceful assembly, for example, sees kettling in all cases, containment in all cases as a violation. We say basically it can am amount to uh, arbitrary detention and in that case it becomes unlawful. But, but the, pr the principle is it must be focused on the individuals. There are uh, cases where the entire assembly can be declared um, uh, unlawful. Uh, that's, that's a very exceptional case and there the test is widespread and serious violence. Um, so one particular person who engages in serious violence and who can be arrested does not render, it must be widespread and, and serious. Um, then the other question becomes, what about an yeah, yeah, a, a assembly that's not yet violent? Um, but it's, there are all kinds of indications that it will become violent. And there are three situations under which an assembly can be deemed to be violent. So if there's incitement to violence, uh, if it's the violence can be shown to if there's evidence that it's imminent um, and where there's evidence that there's intention to use violence, then the conduct of the individuals concerned can be deemed to be violent. And again, if this is widespread and serious, the entire group can be uh, can be seen as violent. Those are the that, that's the the, the, the the that's the worst case sort of scenario. But then there's another very interesting point, and that is what about a fully uh, a peaceful assembly that is highly disruptive. Um, so people sitting on a highway, I think there was an example in Peru of I think 75 days or so where people sit on a highway, not using force at all, 
but the vehicles cannot uh, cannot move. And and so again, this was something where the committee had a um, had a long discussion about whether um, violence can, in such cases, uh, be used at all. So so a non-violent group can violence be used against a non-violent group at all? Um, and and uh, predictably a breakdown, which says, well, this disrupts the entire. Uh, um, community and it, it has an impact on the economy and so forth and at, at some point enough is enough and others will say you cannot use violence if there's not violence. So the language eventually is that it's um, if it's serious and if the disruption is serious and, and, and sustained. Now we don't have a good authority for that. Um, the, the authority we use is actually a, a report uh, that I wrote as a special rapporteur in 2016. So we quote that particular report, but it feels a bit circular in, in the journal comment to quote, this was Maina Kiai and myself, uh, we wrote in 2016 for, the, for, for a council and, and we use it serious and sustained. But th that was the closest we got to, um, to some kind of compromise of when of what is a what is a, a test without being able to say how do you measure it uh, because do you say it's five days or do you say it is 50, 75 days or something like that so serious and sustained is the language we use there uh, thanks a lot um marco any comments on that so then turning to the to the next question is um um Okay, so is, is it in the area of so many, in, in an era of so many populist experiences, can this ambiguous perception of human security be used to undermine the right to take part in an assembly, um, whether it's physical or virtual? So this alludes to some of the concerns that we've been talking about, a kind of mixed purposes, the, the use of um, um, uh, kind of con concerns to limit freedom of assembly. I mean, any thoughts on that? And of course, given the timing of the general comment, I mean, these issues must have been absolutely in the forefront of the committee's mind. Yes, um, the, 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 the general comment follows the language of, of Article 21 very closely. So it, it's, it, it, it lists the grounds and it uses the exact terms. Um, national security is the first one listed in, the, in Article 21 and it's the first one listed here. I initially swapped it around um, because the one about public morals, for example, I, I, I almost want to hide it somewhere. Um, and and, uh, and and not and 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 even the one um, about public order, um, and and so then I looked at how often did we use it in the committee, and then I used that. But my colleague said no, we have to we we, we have to stick to it. And, it, and and it became an important point to say we stick to the language. And whenever there's a dispute, people say, well, let's let's stick to the, because the states have signed it. So the terms used are national security, and and then we in a way repeat the Saracusa principles uh, interpretation of that, and say so the interest of national security may serve as a ground for restrictions if such restrictions are necessary to preserve the state's capacity to protect the existence of the nation. Um, its territorial integrity or political independence against a credible threat uh, or, or, or use of force. This threshold will only exceptionally be met by assemblies that are peaceful. So it's it's almost to we put the first one there and say it's very unlikely that that uh, if it's if we're really talking about a peaceful assembly that you can rely on this one. Then the second one is public safety um, to be invoked as a ground for restrictions. Um, and so, so that's not where COVID would fit in. Um, this is where there's a, a, a real and significant risk to the safety of persons, to the life or security of the persons, or similar risk of serious damage to property. So that's where the breach that will break down kind of thing will, will fit in. But public safety, bystanders uh, as well. Then public order is a very nebulous sort of concept, especially if your starting point is some disruption must be tolerated. Um, and, 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 and again, the word that there's interesting, we at some point use the word tolerated, but we, we took that out because tolerant, so tolerance also sounds like you are against it. You just say, okay, for the time being, let's do it. And so on. So we, uh, we, we didn't use the word tolerate there, but public order refers to the sum of rules that ensure the proper functioning of society or the set of fundamental principles on the which society is founded. And that includes human rights then. So we say public order um, you, you cannot use a very narrow conception of public order 
on the basis of which you can uh, uh, limit peaceful assemblies. It has to be the public, the underlying principles of public order, the human rights in the society. Otherwise, you you, you get these very uh, uh, broad laws that say you you uh, broke the peace, um, and that will be the first thing to be used by states. So then we try to limit it as well. Public health, I've mentioned already. And then morals, yes, it's there, um, it's, and it's second last one. Uh, we, we cannot avoid using the term morals there. And there may be extreme cases where morals may be, may be relevant uh, if one sees, for example, uh, um, animal, if, if, if you don't see animal rights uh, as, as a basis, but action against animals can be wrong because of, of, of morals. So, so maybe it's not wrong that it's there, but it's so easily abused in, in the context of LGBTI and so forth as well. So there we then explicitly said that if used at all, this ground should not be used to protect understandings of morality depriving exclusively from a single social, philosophical or religious tradition. And then because we had a case dealing with this, um, we said restrictions based on this ground may not be imposed because of opposition to expressions of sexual orientation or gender identity. We don't use it everywhere, but in this particular case, instance because we had an earlier case we used it but yes so so that was and then the rights and freedoms of others is the last ground but that was indeed a challenge is to to make sure that these grounds are not too broad so Sorry, we also have a question about which you've touched on already, which is the differences between online and offline assemblies and the question in particular asks whether um, it's appropriate, for example, to require um, uh, on, offline, uh, sorry, online assemblies to have processes of notification. I mean, sh surely we need to rethink um, the sort of circumstances of online assemblies and, and recalibrate the kind of conditions that relate to them. Yeah, yeah, that's precisely what was my con concern and, and, and what we discussed in the committee is, are you not bringing offline restrictions also online? You think you're doing the, the human rights community a favor, but you are actually opening up a, a sort of a Trojan horse. Um, but I think it's the, the very example. So, so then we started asking what would be examples where this happens and notification was the first one. The, the, um, the requirement for notification is, is, um, is based on the idea that the police must be able to facilitate. So notification is also not required if there's minimal impact. Um, and so spontaneous assembly or the impact, for example, on traffic is negligible. Uh, notification cannot be required. And I think exactly that same argument will be, will be asked online is why do you really need notification online? So it, it, it seemed to me more of a serious problem uh, when we looked at it in an abstract, but then when we try to identify where it can be used, everything can be abused, of course. Um, but uh, assuming at least some kind of bona fides um, then, then I think th th that argument should prevail. Okay, thanks. And then just one last question. I was uh, commenting that in Jammu and Kashmir, as you probably know, there's been uh, an, an internet ban since, uh, since last August, I think, which uh, apparently has just been lifted yesterday. I didn't know, and if it has been, that's oh, okay. mm. new. Um, but just um, you know, kind of your views on, uh, you know, to what extent these kind of uh, bans on the internet uh, are in breach of international law and, and to the extent that, you know, online protests may have taken place uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, um, you know, would that be in breach of the uh, provisions in General Comment 37 or the guidance in General Comment 37? Yes, I, I think the, the, the problem with, with, the, with the internet ban is that it's such a blunt tool um, and, and so the, the, the idea of blanket uh, uh, prohibitions on all assemblies that means that you don't, don't have a necessity proportionality assessment in each case. Uh, and then the, 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 I think the, the very same problem applies with, uh, with the internet uh, and, and blockages and shutdowns, um, that it's such a blunt instrument that you cannot really say that you have shown that, that it's at, as targeted as it should be. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's bring us to the end. Anything you'd like to supplement at the end here, Marco? Sorry, I found it difficult to unmute. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm very happy with, uh, with, with everything. So, so, th thanks a lot for this, this very lovely event.
Okay, well, great. Well, just to say very warm thanks from me and for all, from all of the Bonavera to both of you for, for, for participating today. It's been really an interesting uh, conversation. And to say to those of you who are part of the Mood community that this will be um, put online uh, on our YouTube channel uh, sometime the next day or two. So for those of your colleagues who haven't been able to make it and would like to look at it, it will be available on the Bonavera website. And then to say as well that next week's Bonavera discussion group, we'll be hearing from Professor Lena Salome, who will be talking about, uh, basically talking to one of her articles in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies on the practice of secularization around the way in which law deals with religion. And she is going to argue that the, the rules in relation to um, uh, infant um, uh, circumcision in Germany is really an example of this and that it fails to pay sufficient respect to uh, minority religions and minority traditions and communities. So uh, please join us for that. Um, John Bowers, uh, the principal of Brazenose, will be responding. He's um, an expert in the field of uh, religious freedom. So that should be an interesting conversation. Uh, and for the rest, just to thank you once again for attending. It's always great to see the array of many familiar names who are here. And I'm sorry that in some ways that it's not in person, but in other ways, I'm very grateful because we probably have never been able to have uh, Christoph and Mar Marco so easily together. And this has really enabled us to draw on some of the world's great, great minds in human rights. So in the meantime, thanks for, very much to Christoph and Marco and wish you all well. And hopefully we'll see you back at a, a Bonavera event again soon. Bye now. Thanks Bye. for hosting us.